Hello and good morning. My name is Marissa Streckfus. I am the claims manager for RT Pro Exec, located in Bloomfield, Connecticut. I would like to welcome everyone to this webinar brought to you by RT Pro Exec, the management liability division of RT Specialty. RT Specialty is one of the country's leading wholesale brokers with over $6 billion in annual premium and over 1,300 employees. RT Pro Exec is the financial lines division of RT Specialty and is the country's leading wholesaler of management, professional, and transactional insurance coverages with over $1 billion in annual premium and nearly 300 team members. In our webinar today, we are going to be discussing developments in the directors and officers liability arena. 2018 was a very eventful year in the world of DNO liability with significant implications for 2019 and beyond. We are fortunate enough to have with us this morning to discuss these issues my friend, colleague, and personal DNO guru, Kevin LaCroix. Kevin is, an, is the Executive Vice President of RT Pro Exec, and he sits in our Ohio office. Kevin has been involved with DNO liability issues for over 35 years. He is also the author of the widely read blog, The DNO Diary, which the New York Times called influential, and the Wall Street Journal described as widely hollowed. Kevin is going to be discussing the top 10 developments in the world of directors and offices officer's liability for 2018. First, a few preliminaries. Our audience members can submit questions using the dialogue panel in the right-hand column. There is a Q&A feature that you will see on the uh, bottom right hand of your screen. So if you have questions, please submit them there. We are also very interested in your thoughts on this webinar, and we would be grateful if after this session you could drop one or both of us a note to let us know your thoughts about today's session. Our final slide in the presentation this morning will have our email addresses. And with that, I'll turn the presentation over to Kevin. Kevin, take it away. Thank you, Marissa, and good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Um, we have a lot to talk about this morning because 2019 was a very eventful year. Before I get into the specifics, one point I want to emphasize for everyone is that um, the views I'm going to express are exclusively my views and not those of RT Specialty or of any of its clients. So the first topic I'm going to discuss today is uh, a litigation trend, the trend of U.S. securities class action litigation. The reason we start by talking about U.S. securities class action litigation is that it is the, by far the most significant severity risk for public companies and for their insurers. And it so significantly affects the results of the DNL underwriters that if you want to talk about the things that's most affecting DNL underwriters, you really do have to start with securities class action litigation. Now, I know many of you dialing in may not have uh, public company activities. You may be focused exclusively on private companies, but this is still relevant for you because the effect of securities class action litigation is so significant on the reported results of the DNO underwriters that it will even affect the marketplace for private company DNO. With that, I'm going to turn to a bar graph. This bar graph shows the numbers of federal court securities class action lawsuits that were filed each year during the period 2008 through 2018. Now, I know a number of things immediately jump off the page to you, uh, page at everyone looking at this screen, and of course, those are those two towers over on the right-hand side. I think it's, before you focus on those, it's important to note that every year since 2012, the number of securities class action lawsuits has increased. But even with that gradual increase since 2012, what happened in 2017 was unprecedented. And we're gonna be talking in this morning's webinar about many of the factors that led to that significant increase in 2017. With respect to 2017, it is important to note that the 412 securities class action lawsuits is the highest annual number since at least 2001, the year of the IPO laddering cases. And if you factor out the IPO laddering cases, it's the highest number of securities class action lawsuits in any annual period ever. Um, with the event of the significant number of class action lawsuits in 2017, the question was, well, was that just a one-year anomaly, or is this uh, rather a harbinger of things to come? And I think with 
the 403 securities class action lawsuits in 2018, I think we have to be prepared for the possibility that this is the new normal. And um, even though there was a slight drop off between 2017 and 2018, about a 2% drop, once you factor in state court securities class action lawsuits, a topic I'm going to be turning to in, top, in, in point two of my top 10 list, it may be that the number of securities class action lawsuits, both state and federal, um, is even greater in 2018 than 2017. Just to put those uh, 403 lawsuits in 2018 into perspective, the 2018 filing total is nearly 210% above the 1996 to 2016 annual average number of filings of 193, well over uh, double, almost triple the number of the annual average. So the question is, what in the world is going on? Well, the most significant factor is reflected in this slide, the second slide, which shows a breakdown of the filings between two categories of lawsuits. In the blue are what I'm going to call traditional securities class action lawsuits. These are lawsuits under either Section 10 of the 34 Act or Section 11 of the 33 Act alleging misrepresentations in public statements. The orange lawsuits are merger objection lawsuits. These are lawsuits brought against companies that are selling themselves in an acquisition transaction, and usually the basis of the lawsuit is that there are misrepresentations and the proxy statement being used to solicit votes in favor of the merger transaction, or that there's inadequate value being given to the shareholders of the acquired company. Clearly, there's something going on with those merger objection lawsuits in 2017 and 2018. And what is going on is as a result of case law developments in Delaware in 2016, cases that in the past that might have been followed in state court, particularly in Delaware state court, are now being filed in federal court. And so it's a shift of lawsuits from state court to federal court, a forum shift. If that were all that was happening, this might be a very different conversation. But that's not the only thing that's going on here. And in that respect, I want everyone to focus, looking at the bar graph, at the blue bar starting in 2012 and going through 2018. And you can see a steady, consistent increase in the number of traditional securities class action lawsuits. The fact is, even if you were to disregard entirely the merger objection lawsuits that were filed in 2018, we still would be talking about the historically significant level of securities class action lawsuits. The 200, 213 traditional securities class action lawsuits filed in 2018 is 13% above the annual average 193 between 1996 and 2016. To see the significance of that, I want to look at the, the data in a slightly different way. So we're going to look at a different slide. This slide shows percentages. The prior two slides showed numbers of lawsuits. This shows percentage of lawsuits. It expresses the securities class action activity as a relation between the number of lawsuits and the number of companies that are listed on the U.S. exchanges. So to look at 2018, for example, of the 403 securities class action lawsuits in 2018, 385 of them involved U.S. listed companies. Using the year-end number for the number of U.S. listed companies, roughly 4,400, you have a ratio of 8.7%. That is the ratio of the number of lawsuits to the number of U.S. listed companies. And you can see that the ratio, 8.7%, is the highest during the period reflected on the slide, and in fact, the highest it's ever been. To put that in practical terms, that means the chance of a U.S. listed company getting hit with a securities class action lawsuit was about 1 in 12 during 2018, significantly above the 25 to 3% litigation rate in the annual, annual average between 1996 and um, 2016. So um, what you have is the likely, a greater likelihood of a, a lawsuit getting hit, uh, of a company getting hit with a lawsuit, that is. Even if we were to take out the distorting effect of the merger objection lawsuits, we still would have a litigation rate of approaching 5%, roughly 4.7%. 
or uh, meaning that even just talking about traditional lawsuits, the chance of a company getting hit with a class action lawsuit is about 1 in 20, significantly above the historical rate, uh, almost double the historical rate, speaking just in terms of the uh, traditional lawsuits, and almost triple the rate when you talk, it, it could include the merger objection lawsuits. We're going to return to the implications of all this for the DNO carriers, but I think the message is from point number one that we are in a significantly different securities litigation environment, and that has significant implications for public companies and for their insurers. So, Marissa, that's all I have on point number one. Do you have any questions for me? We did get an interesting question from the crowd, Kevin. Do you have any idea as to the percentage of smaller companies that are affected by these traditional security claims, or are the overwhelming majority of those affecting mid-cap or large-cap companies? It's a great question, and um, actually, if I may um, refer to historical models first. Back in the day when I was a Dino um, insurance underwriter, we tried to look at the things that were factors predictive of securities class action activity, and we concluded that a company size as measured by market capitalization was by far the most important marker. Basically, the bigger the company was, the more likely it was to get hit with a lawsuit. To the point back in those days, and I'm talking about uh, the late 90s and early 2000s, that we felt that the security litigation risk of a smaller company was so much lower that we could price those at a much more advantageous rate. Uh, I wish that things were still that predictable. Um, as the securities litigation bar has changed, as there's become increased competition among the plaintiff lawyers, it's no longer the case that the smaller companies are categorically safer than the larger companies. And there's a new class of plaintiff securities lawyers that are focusing on those smaller companies. In answer to the question, I can't give you chapter and verse, but I will say research by Professor Michael Klausner of the Stanford Law School has shown that um, smaller companies are being targeted in significant numbers. And so it is no longer the case that those companies can feel that they are less likely to get hit or that DNO underwriters can underwrite the risk on the assumptions that those companies are rarely hit. It is certainly no longer the case that the larger the company, the likely are that they are to get hit. Uh, the, the spread of the size of companies is much larger than in the past. Kevin, do these numbers also include IPO companies? Uh, they do if the IPO company was hit with a securities class action lawsuit in federal court. These numbers do not include state court lawsuits. So if, for example, a company that completed an IPO recently was during 2018 hit with a securities class action lawsuit in state court, that would not be reflected in these numbers. This, these numbers solely reflect federal court lawsuits for the simple reason that the state court cases are very hard to track. And that's a topic I'm going to re be returning to in the next point. So I will save my additional thoughts on that subject for some subsequent slides. So given the the changes that we've seen, in the, especially in the past couple of years with the securities litigation, what do you anticipate will happen in 2019? Well, uh, you know, we're only a couple of weeks in, but I think we're uh, far enough in that I can say the plant lawyers haven't uh, skipped a beat at all as we've headed into 2019. There were already well over 20 securities class action lawsuits filed in 2019, so all signs are that uh, things will pick up exactly where we left off at the end of 2018. Um, part of the big reason for the significantly increased numbers of securities lawsuits in recent years is um, categorical changes in the securities class action bar. And that hasn't gone away. And those plaintiff lawyers remain active and will remain active. So as I said before, I think we have to assume that that level of litigation activity in 2017 and 2018, that's the new normal. And that's, that's the world we're all going to have to live in, and we're going to have to conduct ourselves accordingly. If it's okay with you, Marissa, I'm going to push on to topic two um, and in the interest of time. Yes, please. So um, my next topic is uh, picking up on that question Marissa asked about the state court litigation. Why are we talking about state court litigation at all? given that we're talking about securities class action activity. And um, just to cut to the chase, 
in 2000, March 2018, the U.S. Supreme Court in the Cyan decision uh, held that um, under the uh, 1933 Act, the Securities Act of 1933, state courts retain concurrent jurisdiction for liability claims under the 33 Act. This means that, for example, a company that conducts an IPO can be sued either in federal court under the federal securities laws or in state court under the federal securities laws. And the plaintiff's lawyers have the option. Um, and once they file that state court action against the IPO company, that case cannot be removed to federal court. This creates uh, the unfortunate possibility that the hypothetical IPO company we're talking about could find itself uh, not only having to deal with a federal court securities class action lawsuit, but could also have a state court securities class action lawsuit without any procedural mechanism to, to uh, consolidate those cases or even to coordinate the cases, leading the possibility that the company would have to fight a multi-front war. Indeed, there's even the possibility that that hypothetical IPO company could be hit not only with a federal court and a state court lawsuit, but it could be hit with state court lawsuits in multiple different states, meaning that it would be a multi-front war. I want to emphasize that this is a risk not only for IPO companies, but also for companies conducting secondary offerings and M&A companies. So it's only been since March, um, Marissa's question a moment ago about whether my statistics included state court litigation um, uh, suggested the, the concern we all have of how big a risk has this turned out to be. And the answer is we're still in the early days and it's hard to tell, but what this uh, slide shows and what, and what I've been able to track is there have been significant numbers of IPO related Section 11 lawsuits in state courts in California and New York. My absolutely off-the-cuff, unaudited tally for California is that there were at least 11 state court lawsuits filed in California state courts and at least nine in New York. Those numbers, uh, don't take them to the bank. That's just what I, I've been able to track. In addition to the California state court lawsuits, there have also been lawsuits filed in Colorado, Texas, Tennessee, Massachusetts, and there may well have been other states that I've not been able to track. Uh, some of these state court lawsuits have been accompanied by federal court lawsuits, but not all of them. And I'm aware of at least two instances where the IPO company at issue has been hit solely with a state court lawsuit. So those numbers that we were looking at earlier about federal court lawsuits would not reflect a state court lawsuit. But the bottom line is for an IPO company and possibly a company conducting a secondary offering or involved in even an M&A transaction might face Section 11 litigation just in state court, in state court and federal court, or in federal court and multi-states. The bottom line is the cases are going to be more costly to defend. And the Dino insurers know that. So how have they reacted? Well, again, we're still in the early days, and I think the DNO insurers are still trying to find an equilibrium solution. Several carriers have made it clear that they intend to have a separate retention for state court securities litigation. I've seen retentions as high as 10 million. In some instances, the carriers are also requiring co-insurance for the state court lawsuits. While at the same time, in some instances, at least some carriers are not requiring a separate state court securities litigation retention. Uh, I, I think the one uniform factor is that the pricing for IPO companies is higher than it's been in the past. So any company contemplating an IPO or at least hoping to conduct an IPO after the SEC reopens would be looking at the possibility of significantly higher premium than they might have paid even in the recent past. So Marissa, that's all I have to say about Cyan. Any questions? So it does appear now that um, given Cyan that we're seeing um, more state court filings by plaintiff's lawyers, and that could be uh, significant in terms of additional numbers of securities class actions. So what are your thoughts on uh, additional litigation activity? Well, as I, as I indicated, we are seeing some activity. Uh, you know, I'm aware of instances where um, companies that conducted IPOs in 2016 or 2017 were hit with securities lawsuits in both state and federal court. Um, I'm aware of instances where companies that conducted IPOs in 2016, 2017, 2018 
were sued just in state court. Um, that does mean we're seeing increased class action litigation activity. It does mean it's going to be harder to track. Um, I think because we're still in the early days, I don't think we have a good handle on what it is going to mean in terms of the overall scale of litigation activity. I think we're all going to have to watch that very closely. The uncertainty clearly is a concern for the DNO carriers, including especially the possibility of uh, having to defend a multi-front uh, lawsuit. Kevin, do you know if federal or state securities actions are more expensive to defend? Good question. Um, you know, the, the, the problem is that many of the procedural reforms of the PSLRA, the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1996, apply in federal court but not in state court. Mm -hmm. So there are a number of protections that are in place. For example, the discovery stay that arguably would not be in place in state court. So uh, litigants might be forced to move into full uh, litigation mode sooner in state court. Also, there's at least scuttlebutt that it's harder to get a motion to desist, dismiss granted in state court. That certainly was the track record in California state court even prior to Scion. So the expectation is the case is likely to go forward. Um, so I, you know, I don't know that there's enough data to give anyone an absolute uh, straight answer, but I think my presumption would be given all the factors I just cited that state court litigation well, could well be uh, more expensive. Certainly, if you've got to defend parallel state and federal litigation, that's going to be more expensive than it would have been to defend just federal litigation alone. So based on these statutes, we understand that Congress passed the Securities Litigation Uniform Standards Act in 1998 to, to have some uh, consistency with procedures. Do you think Congress is going to do anything to fix that? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't think when Congress passed SLUSA in 1998, they had any intention of allowing federal securities litigation to continue to go forward in state court, even under the concurrent jurisdiction provisions of the 33 Act. It's a relatively simple fix. Um, if, however, uh, that's going to happen, it would require uh, Congress to um, act uh, um, rationally, um, and you know, I leave it to the audience to decide whether right now that's the state of play in Congress. Um, I will say I'm aware of efforts by um, several groups, including in particular the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, to mount an effort in favor of security litigation reform. I'm going to be part of an event in Washington at the end of February, sponsored by the U.S. Chamber, focused on security litigation reform. So it may be that if we get past uh, the current uh, stalemate and get to the point where Congress is functioning again, that uh, this is something that could appear on the agenda. I'll leave it to the audience to assess what the likelihood of that happening will be. Marissa, if, if it's okay with you, I'm going to move on to the next topic in the interest of time. Sure, Kevin. So the third topic on our top ten list is what I've called event-driven litigation. I'm drawing a distinction between traditional securities class action litigation and event-driven litigation. In the past, I'm old enough to remember the days when a securities lawsuit was typically going to be about either an alleged accounting misrepresentation or a financial statement misrepresentation. In, in either event, it was usually about the financial condition of the company. But um, as the plaintiff's bar has changed and as the number of restatements have dropped, it's pretty clear at least part of the plaintiff's bar is trying to pursue a different model. Um, among other things, in 2017, the number of accounting restatements was at an all-time low. So the plaintiff's lawyers are trying a different approach. They're expanding their inventory. And what they're focusing on are a significant events and the business operations of the reporting companies. The company has a significant event that draws negative press results and a significant drop in the share price and the plaintiff's lawyers file securities class action lawsuit. I think the prototypical example of this is the lawsuit that was filed against the uh, building supply manufacturing company, Arconic. Everyone on the call, I'm sure, will, re will recall the Grenfell Towers fire in London in summer 2017. Terrible tragedy resulted in loss of life, property damage. Clearly, there was going to be litigation. 
I don't think anybody anticipated that it would be securities litigation in which the investors allege that Arconic misled investors about um, its vulnerability given the propensity of its building materials to cause these building flares. There were several high profile examples of these kind of cases in 2018. Uh, one, uh, a set of cases that I'm going to be talking about at greater length later this morning, is the litigation that was filed against Edison International and PG&E, two California utilities, after there were media reports that the company's uh, facilities had sparked the wildfires in California in 2018 and 2017. So there were no accounting misrepresentations. There were no financial statement misrepresentations. But what there was was a significant event that brought negative publicity and caused the companies to get sued. Another example is the lawsuit that was filed against Boeing following the Lion Air 610 crash. They were uh, it, soon after the terrible tragedy in which the plane went down and more than 100 people were killed. Indeed, indeed not all of the bodies had yet been recovered. There was a lawsuit filed, hardly surprising given the circumstances. Not a wrongful death lawsuit or a negligence lawsuit, not a lawsuit on behalf of the victims of the air crash, but instead on behalf of the real victims, the shareholders of Boeing who supposedly were misled about the exposure of the company if one of its planes were to be involved in an airliner crash. Um, another lawsuit, one that I'm sure uh, involves circumstances familiar to listeners, is a lawsuit that was filed in December 2018 against Marriott after news that the company had been involved in a significant data breach involving its Starwood Unit's customer database. These lawsuits are very different from each other. What they have in common is that none of the lawsuits alleged accounting misrepresentations all of them alleged a significant negative event in the company's business operations that resulted in a share price and alleged damages to investors. And uh, the plaintiffs in those cases are seeking uh, class relief on behalf of the class of investors alleging damages under the federal securities laws. So, uh, you know, when I talk about these kinds of cases, so there are several uh, other common factors. One is, in my view, they tend to be weak cases. They really tend to be more in the nature of mismanagement rather than misrepresentation, yet they are framed in the form of federal securities lawsuits. They frequently lack fundamental allegations, including, for example, scienter allegations under uh, the Securities Act of 1934 in order to allege damages under Section 10, it is incumbent on the plaintiff to allege not only that there was a misrepresentation, but that the defendants acted with intent to deceive or such a high degree of care, want of care that they must have known that the statements were false. And many of these cases lack those allegations. The one thing I will say, when we were looking at those numbers of the increased class action lawsuits in 2016, and especially 2017 and 2018, these event-driven lawsuits are a significant factor. And um, when I've spoken about the changes in the plaintiff securities bar, this is one of the uh, consequences of that. Um, these are lawsuits that typically might not have been brought in the past, but the new style plaintiff's lawyers are bringing. This represents a challenge for the DNO underwriters because Historically, traditionally, the way DNO underwriters would go about underwriting any given public company risk is they would delve into the financial statements. They would become masters of the accounting of the company and, and look for problems in the financial statements of the company. But that kind of underwriting isn't going to get you to this kind of risk. Um, and this is one of several examples I'm going to be giving where the change in the way the plaintiff's lawyers are bringing lawsuits uh, represents a challenge for the under, underwriting approach of the DNO underwriters. Um, that's all I have on this topic. Marissa, any questions? Yes. So we understand that these cases can be weak for failing to meet certain elements of uh, the claims against the corporations. Are the claims always weak? And why would plaintiff's lawyers be bothering so many weak cases? 
Well, you know, they're not always weak, um, and there are examples uh, where plaintiff's lawyers did achieve significant recoveries. The most high-profile example I would refer to is the BP Deepwater Horizon case filed in 2010. Um, the the um, event there obviously was the Deepwater Horizon a disaster in the Gulf of Mexico. That case settled for $150 million. So clearly not all of these cases are weak. But most of the cases that have been filed in 2017 and 2018, in my view, um, I don't think I'm being um, unfair to characterize them as weaker than um, uh, you know, the high-profile cases that have resulted in the biggest recoveries. Why are the plaintiff's lawyers filing it? Well, I, I think there are two things going on. One is the change in the plaintiff's bar that I've mentioned a number of times. The other is these new-style plaintiff's lawyers, I think, have adopted a business model where they're much more willing to accept a greater likelihood that their case will be dismissed on the theory that I'll file a lot of lawsuits, uh, enough of them will get through to not only finance the losses, lawsuits that don't get through, but also uh, allow me to make a good living, pay the rent, pay the mortgage, and so on. I, you know, I, I don't think that's the model that the biggest, most prominent plaintiff's lawyers uh, would endorse, and, and those plaintiff's lawyers aren't involved in these suits. But from the perspective of the DNL carriers and the uh, potential uh, defendant companies, it really doesn't matter who the plaintiff's lawyer is that's bringing the lawsuit. The really, the only thing that matters is that the lawsuits are being filed. Any other questions, Marissa, or should we move on? I think we can move on to the next topic, Kevin. Great, thanks, Marissa. So my next topic is one that um, I think has been pretty high profile. I think. Uh, most observers have been talking about the possibility of data breach lawsuits arising out of, uh, rather, securities lawsuits arising out of data breaches. Um, in talking about this, I want to draw a distinction. I, I think it's apparent from this slide, but I'm not talking about the consumer or regulator lawsuits that might be filed against a company experiencing a data breach. I'm talking about a DNO lawsuit a lawsuit alleging liability against the directors and officers of the company in connection with the data breach. So um, there have been cases filed over the years, and um, in the first bullet point here, I cite a number of them. The uh, Wyndham Worldwide case, the Target case, the Home Depot case, all of which were filed as shareholder derivative lawsuits, all of which resulted in dismissals. So the track record for the plaintiff's lawyers was not good. And really, there, there could have been a question asked whether this was going to prove to be a fruitful area for the plaintiff's lawyers. And to, starting in 2017, that started to change. Um, there were a number of lawsuits filed as securities class action lawsuits in the wake of data breach revelations. And I'll come back to that. But probably the most significant developments were two um, things that happened in 2018. The first, in March 2018, the Yahoo securities class action lawsuit, which related to the high-profile data breach at Yahoo, was settled for $80 million. It's a watershed event and the development of this kind of litigation because it was the first time that the plaintiff's lawyers secured a significant recovery and a DNO lawsuit arising out of a data breach. A month later, there was another important development involving the successor of Yahoo, that is Alteba, um, in the first ever SEC enforcement action uh, and settlement relating to data breach disclosures, Altaba agreed to pay $35 million in settlement of the SEC enforcement action. So there were two developments during 2018 that I think are significant in the evolution of this kind of litigation. And it, uh, as a result of that, it's not surprising to me that we saw uh, during 2018 a number of securities class action lawsuits filed uh, in the wake of data breach revelations. Uh, two, or rather three in 2018, Chegg Inc., an online education company, was hit with a securities last lawsuit, as was Wazoo, a Chinese uh, hospitality company. Alphabet, the parent company of Google, uh, was hit with a securities lawsuit relating to uh, revelations involving data vulnerabilities in its Google Plus product. And then, of course, there was the December 2018 lawsuit against Marriott. So uh, several 
uh, securities lawsuits filed in 2018. I think it's noteworthy that several of these lawsuits, including, I would say, Marriott and um, in 2017, the Equifax lawsuit, are both high profile and dangerous lawsuits. I note in the fi follow final bullet point, um, the point that there are SEC investigations involving data breaches or other cyber disclosures, I'll come back to that in a little bit, a little bit later. So uh, that's all I had to say on the data breach litigation. Marissa, any questions? Yes. Yeah. So we see a good number of companies being hit with these security lawsuits after a data breach. A lot of them seem to be larger corporations, but we know that companies of various sizes get hit with data breaches all the time. What do you think um, contributes to certain companies getting hit with security lawsuits over others? Well, first of all, I'm not sure I would agree that it's only bigger companies that are getting sued. Um, certainly Chegg and WaterZoo are not particularly large companies, but I think probably the biggest factor that is that distinguishes between when a company is going to uh, have a chance of getting hit with a security suit and, and it's less likely it has to do with how the share price responds. Um, there have been some very high profile uh, data breaches, Anthem, Sony, uh, Barnes & Noble, um, yet that have not resulted in security suits. And I think the common factor among the companies that don't get hit with security suits is that um, the, secure, the share price has not reacted as much. Are the DNO carriers adding any terms and conditions to address data breach related claims? I, I, I haven't seen anything, Marissa. It, it's a question that comes up a lot, and, and it's actually something that I, it wouldn't surprise me to find out the DNO carriers are talking about internally. You know, in a competitive marketplace, I think that is just something that probably wouldn't fly. But, um, you know, it doesn't, wouldn't surprise me at all to find out there's, there, there aren't discussions going on. But the short answer is I'm not seeing, at least as a general matter, any movement in the marketplace for the carriers to add anything to specifically address uh, the risk of uh, DNO-related data breach claims. I think in the interest of time risk, I'm going to push on to the next topic. Yes, please. So uh, the next topic relates to privacy. And in talking about this, I want to draw a distinction between data breach risks and privacy risks. These two topics are related. Clearly, a data breach has privacy elements. But in drawing this distinction, what I'm talking about is the difference between issues having to do with the security of data and companies' use of data. And I think it'll make more sense if I talk about a specific example. So this is a timeline showing important developments in 2018 involving privacy issues. The uh, Facebook case in March 2018, I, I think many of you may recall there was very negative publicity for Facebook because it came about that Facebook had allowed its user data to be made accessible to Cambridge Analytica, which then used that data in connection with efforts associated with uh, U.S. Uh, election campaigns. Um, negative publicity resulted in a share price drop, resulted in a class action lawsuit against Facebook. The point I want to make is there was no breach. There was no breach of, of uh, data at Facebook. Facebook had uh, given the data to Cambridge Analytica as a result of a commercial business relationship between Facebook and Cambridge Analytica. So it, the concerns that were voiced by politicians, consumers, and by shareholders had to do not with the security of the data, but with the use of the data. So that's an example of what I'm talking about when I'm talking about privacy as an issue distinct from a data breach. There were two other significant developments in 2018 that I think underscore the importance of privacy-related issues. One is the May 2018 effectiveness of the EU's General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR, it became effective in May 2018. Very broad in scope, it has the potential for significant penalties. I'm going to be talk, come back and talk about that in the next slide. There was also in June 2018, the California legislature passed its own privacy law, something of an echo of the GDPR, um, has not yet gone into effect, does not go into effect until January 1, 2020, but um, shows how privacy is uh, quickly becoming an important issue. There's also been discussion recently, um, most prominently 
by Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple, calling for comprehensive federal privacy litigate, uh, legislation in the U.S. So um, there could be further legislative developments as well. But to focus just on GDPR for a second, there have already been two GDPR-related securities class action lawsuits in the U.S., one involving Facebook and the other involving Nielsen Holdings. The Facebook lawsuit, I want to emphasize, is different and separate from the March 2018 lawsuit filed in connection with the Cambridge Analytica fiasco. The, the July 2018 Facebook lawsuit had to do with the company's quarterly earnings release where the company disappointed investors because its, its rate of growth was significantly diminished because of unanticipated GDPR-related expenses and difficulties implementing GDPR-related procedures. That resulted in what was the single largest drop in market capitalization by a company in a single day, $120 billion in a single day, and it resulted in a securities class action lawsuit in which the, the allegations are related, among other things, to the company's GDPR, GDPR disclosures. The lawsuit against Nielsen Holdings, the, the media ratings company, was similar in that the company um, reported adverse uh, earnings news uh, based in part on difficulties associated with GDPR. The company's share price declined and it was hit with a securities lawsuit. So, even though uh, GDPR just went into effect in May 2018, we've already seen activities. I think we will in the future see further GDPR-related activities. Uh, the one thing I know for sure is there have already been by separate uh, country-specific data regulators the imposition of fines, and I think we will continue to see that in the future. So any questions on that topic, Marissa? Sure. So we see how uh, regulatory action might lead to follow-on privacy-related lawsuits. Do you see any other ways in which privacy-related issues might lead to management liability litigation? Well, I, you know, I, I think the, the, in your question, you, you pointed to what I think is the likeliest source, which is um, the first uh, step is a regulator imposes a significant fine on a company under the GDPR, and that results in either adverse publicity uh, or significant impact on the company's reported financial results and a drop in the share price, and so you get a follow-on lawsuit. Honestly, when I was looking at GDPR a year ago and anticipating it going to effect, I thought that was going to be the likeliest source of GDPR-related DNO litigation. I didn't really anticipate the kind of lawsuits that were filed against Facebook and Nielsen Holding. So, you know, I think there could be other ways that GDPR will lead to securities litigation. Uh, perhaps um, just adverse publicity about privacy exposure. I think we just have to wait and see. I think the one thing we know for sure is there will be further uh, GDPR-related you know, litigation. In the interest of timers, I'm going to push on to the next topic because we're just up to 6 of 10, so I'm going to pick up the pace a little bit. I think everybody listening has been aware of the Me Too phenomenon. It's now uh, past the first anniversary, and obviously the uh, revelations of Me Too exposures of sexual misconduct involving company officials, politicians, and others have resulted in allegations by the victims of wrongdoing, but it's also resulted in DNO lawsuits where the accountability processes, including not only actions by the wrongdoers, against the wrongdoers by the victims, but actions uh, against corporate management of the companies where the wrongdoing took place, saying that company boards and senior management either allowed the misconduct to take place or turned a blind eye. And the um, Probably the most significant and highest profile case so far is the 21st Century Fox case. I think most people will recall the very high profile revelations there involving misconduct by media figures and the fact that there had been settlements paid by the company uh, based on allegations against the media figures. An institutional investor filed a shareholder derivative lawsuit against the board of 21st Century Fox resulted in a $90 million settlement paid for uh, entirely by DNO insurance. And most importantly, the agreement by 
the corporate board of 21st Century Fox to adopt uh, corporate governance, corporate therapeutics to try to ensure that the misconduct would not recur. In the wake of the 21st Century Fox, there were during 2018 and 2019 a number of other Me Too related DNO lawsuits. Uh, in February 2018, the lawsuit against Wynn Resorts, and those were in the form of both derivative lawsuits and securities class action lawsuits. In 2018, in July 2018, uh, securities lawsuit against National Beverage. August 2018, securities lawsuits against Papa John's and CBS. Um, December 2018, a, loss, a securities lawsuit against Teladoc Health. And just a few days ago, in January 2019, two derivative lawsuits filed against Alphabet, the parent company of Google. Um, a number of lawsuits, these aren't all the same. Uh, for example, the national beverage lawsuit uh, involved the twist that the alleged underlying sexual misconduct involved same-sex alleged uh, misconduct. Teladoc Health uh, was unusual in that the alleged um, activity supposedly involved a consensual um, sexual relationship between a male older um, supervisor and a younger female subordinate. I will stipulate that when you're talking about consent in the context of that kind of relationship, it uh, is a very um, problematic question. But uh, it just shows how the, the allegations involve a variety of factors. One case that isn't on this timeline that I want to talk about because it shows how the cases have evolved is the Nike case, which was a derivative lawsuit filed in August 2018. The allegation is that as a result of the boys club atmosphere at the company, um, uh, men uh, employees were, ab were able to advance, whereas female employees uh, received um, lo lower pay increases and were less able to advance. Um, this is a different point of emphasis than some of these other lawsuits because the Nike lawsuit does not rely as much on actual um, sexual misconduct in the form of unwanted touching or unwanted sexual advances. Um, it's more in the framework of uh, disparate treatment and gender pay disparity. And I will note that that was also a significant factor in the uh, Alphabet Google lawsuit as well. So I think what we've seen is um, these lawsuits have evolved. And I think um, as they uh, continue to be filed, I think we will see how they will continue to evolve. So any questions on that topic, Marissa? Yes. So it appears that these Me Too claims can arise out of circumstances that could create liability under employment practices. So what issues do you see on coverage that, that could arise for circumstances that, that initiate both an EPL and DNO claim? Well, the threshold claim uh, issue is that I think the claims adjuster needs to recognize these are DNO claims and not EPL claims. Um, they're, they're, under the circumstances, there clearly are EPL claims, the claims brought by the victims alleging employment practices, wrongful acts. But the kind of cases I've been talking about are DNO lawsuits and should be treated under the DNO policy because they involve allegations of uh, mismanagement or other wrongful acts by the management of the companies in their roles as managers. Um, one problem I can see arising under a private company you know, policy is the private company policies have exclusions for uh, claims based upon arising out of employment practices, wrongful acts. Those, those exclusions are written so broadly that even though it's a DNO claim that appropriately should be dealt with under the DNO policy, the, uh, the, the EPL claim exclusion of the DNO policy could affect coverage. I think clearly these claims should be covered, and there's a, a way those exclusions can be worded so that the exclusion is not a problem, but I see that as a potential issue. If, if it's okay with you, Marissa, I'm going to push on to point number seven in the interest of time because I want to try and get to all ten before uh, we get to the top of the hour. Thank so you. The, the next topic is climate change. I will say on this topic I've been talking about the possibility of climate change-related DNO issues for many years. And for many years, 
I didn't have any actual claims to talk about. In 2016, that changed when uh, plaintiff shareholders filed a securities class action lawsuit against Exxon Mobil, alleging that the company had misled investors because its internal analysis of its ability to realize the full value of all of its hydrocarbon assets differed from what it was saying publicly, yet it did not change the valuation of its assets on its publicly disclosed balance sheet. Uh, that lawsuit was the subject of a motion to dismiss. In August 2018, the motion to dismiss was denied. Just parenthetically, I note here on the slide that New York Attorney General has also filed a disclosure-related lawsuit against ExxonMobil. An interesting lawsuit. It does show how climate change-related issues can lead to DNO lawsuits, but one lawsuit doesn't make a trend. There have, in fact, been other climate change disclosure lawsuits, and I cite here on the slide actions filed in the UK and Australia where non-governmental organizations have led efforts to try and compel publicly traded companies in those jurisdictions to include climate change disclosure in their public statements. But I really didn't have any other examples of disclosure statements, but events in the past year made me think that the place, the direction that climate change lawsuits may not be so much disclosure, but it may be the kind of event-driven circumstances that I talked about uh, earlier in this webinar. And what made me realize that was in thinking about the lawsuits that I talked about earlier that were filed against Edison International and PG&E against the California wildfires. These lawsuits don't involve accounting misstatements or financial statements, as, as I mentioned. What they do involve is significantly adverse events at those companies based on circumstances driven by climate change. The drought in California contributed to the California wildfires. And if you look at PG&E's disclosures, they specifically ascribe their vulnerability to wildfire liability as a consequence of drought-induced climate change-related conditions in which they operate. Just as with the wildfires in California, companies are doing business in circumstances that could create adverse events uh, in their operations that could result in uh, impacts on their financial reports, on their share price, and then the possibility of them getting hit with securities litigation. And you can certainly think about, for example, a supply chain disruption as a result of uh, rising uh, tidal levels, um, uh, coastal erosion, as a result of drought, um, as a result of wildfires, could cause results, uh, a disruption of operations, supply chain disruptions could result in um, uh, uh, adverse effects on reported financial results and could result in climate change. So um, just this week, the World Economic Forum put out its report and identified climate change as the most significant global risk. Um, and uh, so the, at least the respondents to the World Economic Forum, uh, of, to the survey, see this as significant risk to the extent the feared effects of climate change do result in these kinds of circumstances that, that disrupt business processes, it could be a significant factor in global climate change. It, Marissa, in the interest of time, I'm going to push ahead. So I'm going to move quickly to point eight and just cover quickly um, SEC enforcement action and note that in 2018, when the SEC reported its annual uh, statistics on its enforcement activity, it showed increased activity during the 2018 fiscal year compared to the 2017 fiscal year. In the earlier year, there had been a slump in SEC enforcement activity, and commentators wondered whether this represented a changed priority under the current administration. The increased activity in the most recent reporting year at least says to me that it, it's either a mistake or premature to assume that this current administration is going to be taking a soft pedal approach to administration. 
One final note about the SEC's enforcement statistics. The SEC did note in its enforcement report that as of the end of the fiscal year, on September 30th, 2018, it had over 225 cybersecurity-related investigations open, leading me to believe that in 2019 and beyond, we could see increased numbers of SEC enforcement actions involving cybersecurity issues. I'm going to push on to point nine because I want to make sure we get to point 10. Point nine relates to securities liability arising from the use of social media, something that I think all of us have been concerned about as long as there's been social media. In 2018, for the first time, there was a securities class action lawsuit and an SEC enforcement proceeding arising out of the use of social media. I think everybody in this call probably remembers the famous incident in August 2018 when Elon Musk tweeted that he was going to be taking the company private and that financing was secured. This resulted first in a sheer jump, share price collapse when questions began to be asked, massive trading, and then a securities class action lawsuit. The class action lawsuit remains pending. The SEC filed an enforcement action uh, alleging that they were false and misleading statements in the tweets. The SEC enforcement action has been settled already by payments of fines by the company and Musk himself, the adoption of certain corporate therapeutics. The takeaway on this one, which I'm covering very quickly in the interest of time, is that companies' use of social media creates potential for securities law liability and it creates an underwriting dilemma for the DNO underwriters because, again, the possibility that use of social media might lead to a securities claim is not going to be something that's apparent from the financial statements. So where does that leave us in terms of the DNO marketplace? I think from this overview, I think the point that's clear is a very challenging environment for the DNO underwriters. For starters, as a result of all of the claims that came in during 2016, 2017, 2018, the DNO or underwriters have a massive claims under uh, pipeline that they not only need to, to uh, manage, but they need to set reserves for with obvious implications for their reported results. They also need to be prepared for the new world they're doing business in, that the new reality is there are going to be a lot more DNO claims, and that has significant implications for how they need to manage their claims and how they need to underwrite. At the same time, as I've pointed out along the way, these new developments all present underwriting challenges. The traditional DNO underwriting model of re reviewing financial statements is not going to be sufficient to help underwriters identify potential DNO exposures arising from data security, privacy, HR practices, climate change, social media. So it's a new underwriting environment. Typically, DNO underwriters, in order to deal with uncertainty, would want to be able to raise their prices to be able to address the uncertainty and the inability to underwrite the risk. Unfortunately, in the competitive environment we're in, there may be limits to how much actual room for maneuver the DNO underwriters actually have to raise prices. So going forward, what, what does that mean for us as we head into 2019. Well, number one, I think we're going to hear from the DNO underwriters that they're going to be trying to raise rates. And certainly, if you talk to DNA, any DNO underwriter now, that's the message they're going to try to deliver. And um, they're going to be focused in particular, I think, when they're trying to deliver that message on, uh, for example, private company, a rather primary DNO insurance for public companies and even private companies. The problem for the DNO underwriters is that the laws of supply and demand have not gone away, and we are in a time of abundant insurance capacity, meaning that there's still significant competition and that uh, the market will uh, limit the ability of uh, carriers to try to get increases. If they don't get support in the market, they may have an inability to push for across-the-board increases. So the question is, um, what will likely happen? I think that the, 
the likeliest effects will be seen in the most problematic areas. Uh, we didn't talk about life sciences companies, but it, that is an area of the most significant securities frequency exposure. IPO companies, for the reasons we've alluded to, California companies, I think there will be segments where the DNO underwriters will be trying to focus their efforts. The message for us as we're speaking to our companies is that the carriers are seeking to try and push for increases, and it remains to be seen how a competitive marketplace will enable them to secure the increases. Uh, we're just about out of time, so in the interest of time, I'm going to um, wrap up and then pass the mic back to Marissa. The one final message I want to deliver is that th I've talked a lot about a lot of trends. For those of you who are interested in monitoring those trends, I try and talk about them frequently on the DNO diary. I've got the address here. I hope all of you will follow it and use it as a place to try and keep an eye on all of these developments as we move into 2019. With that, I will turn the microphone back to Marissa. Kevin, thank you so much for leading the discussion this morning. It was really great. So before we break off, we want to remind everyone that we're very interested in your thoughts and reactions to this webinar. So you'll see the contact information for Kevin and myself on your screen. So if you have a moment, please drop one of us a note to let let us know what you thought of today's session. I know some of you had questions in our Q&A box that we weren't able to get to. Please feel free to forward those to us and any other correspondence you might have. So thanks again, everyone, for your time this morning. We wish all of you a very successful 2019, and we look forward to the opportunity to work with all of you. Thank you so much. And Thank you all. Thank you.